ultimately my entire purpose uh, in my work with people and with groups is to awaken the awareness of original brilliance. It's, it's, it's beyond trauma resolution. I understand, believe me, very personally, the importance of trauma resolution. But the goal is the discovery and the embodiment of original brilliance. Before we get into the show, I'd like to say a huge thank you to our sponsor, First Human, of which I am a co-founder. First Human is dedicated to extraordinary impact in the world through exceptional leadership. So if you're looking to elevate the leadership of your team or your organization, then do check us out. We also offer one-to-one coaching. So if you'd like to get coached by me or one of my extraordinarily talented fellow coaches, then head over to firsthuman.com. And with that, back to the show. And we are live. I am extremely excited to say that our guest this week is Stephanie Mines. She has written six books, including this one, which is the one I've read, The Secret of Resilience, Healing Personal and Planetary Trauma Through Morpho Genesis. She's a researcher in the evolution of the human nervous system all the way back to conception. And for anybody who knows my story, that's very exciting to me because a a big part of my work has involved uh, my very early life. Uh, She's a founder of the the Tara Approach, which is a synthesis of, of Western neurobiology and Eastern energy medicine. Uh, She's also connected with a lot of our previous guests on the show. So I'm very excited, Stephanie, to have you on the show. And you joined us from uh, Hawaii, (laughs) which I told you I have (laughs) acute pangs of jealousy over, given that we're experiencing a very wet uh, September here in England right now. Um, Okay, well, let's, uh, yes, like I do with all my guests, I love to start from the start. Stephanie, uh, give us a little bit of your, your, your backstory. Where did you grow up? What were your parents like? You know, t- fill us in a little bit about your, your childhood. Uh, and yeah, and just ground us in your early life, which uh, will provide some context for all of the wonderful work uh, that you've created out there. Yes, it does indeed. Uh, so I was born uh, in the Bronx, New York. Uh, in 1944, so that gives you the perspective and my age. Uh, Which so I would I'm never have guessed. I'm 80 I'm years old. Thing, Stephanie does not look like she was born in the 1940s. And I was born to a family of immigrants, non-English speaking immigrants. So I grew up in a non-English speaking home uh, where not only was English not spoken, it also wasn't read, so there really wasn't any literature or anything to prepare me for the secular world, you might say. I was born into an Orthodox Jewish family, uh, steeped in both the beauty and the restrictions of that orthodoxy. And from the get-go, apparently, I was a rebel. Uh, because I couldn't tolerate uh, many of those restrictions. I crashed the boys' bar mitzvah classes in the temple. I insisted on making friends with the goyim. Uh, I was basically couldn't do anything but be myself, and that caused a lot of problems. And that has gone on my entire life, I will say. It was a very difficult early life and thereby spawned my curiosity about violence. It was a violent household. It was burdened by intergenerational trauma that was exacerbated by my father's service in World War II. So all of those influences assembled themselves in a way that was brutal for me. And to my credit, and I 
am able to give myself credit more and more as I evolve. I saw how incredibly creative I became with those afflictions. And ultimately, to cut a long story short, it led me to explore neuroscience. It led me to explore the mind-body relationship. My doctoral research was in traumatic brain injury, which I had independently discovered my father had. As I said, my parents were not oriented towards things like getting evaluations of intracranial difficulties, so it was undiagnosed. But in putting the pieces together as I evolved, I considered that my father had a head injury, and I began to ask questions. And the fact was that he had had a serious accident as a child, which went untreated, and very likely because of the reports from his behavior in war, was reactivated by war service, by combat shock, which I write about in one of my books. So mm. this was incredibly liberating. That discovery for me was astoundingly liberating and influenced my nervous system significantly. I would say it entirely recalibrated my nervous system, just that discovery. And wow. I did the research clinically uh, for my doctoral studies. And then that led to further curiosity about the human nervous system, which has and continues to shape my life so that I now understand the earliest origins, I believe, of traumatic shaping and how to unravel it, which is, of course, the secret of resilience. Right. Yeah. Beautifully put. And, and you mentioned your own experience of violence in your childhood. When did you first start to come to grips with that? Yeah, good question. I think it's a very good question. Uh, I think I really became aware of those significant impacts, you know, prior to the birth of my first child, uh, when I landed, there's lots I've left out in this story. That's my next book. But there was a very significant interval in my life uh, that is located in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, just prior to the rise of the Black Panther Party and that incredible revolutionary activity that I was deeply magnetized to. And it was in that interval, really pr just prior to all of this, prior to the relationship that resulted in my first child, uh, prior to my entry into that fray, when I started to look at the patterns of my relationships, because those patterns were having serious consequences on my well-being. They, I was not making good choices uh, in my relationships. I was passionate, and my relationships were very passionate in the way that they played out, but usually to my detriment. Uh, and so I be, that's really, I think, where my investigations were born, to look at how this happened, that I came to make these choices, and starting to consider what I could do about that. It took me a while. I had to get a doctorate <laughs> to have the wonderful marriage I now have. Right. And I, well, that's a, that's a very common pattern in recovery is, is it starts with this observation oh i'm i'm repeating something here you know what's what's behind that so, something like that right and yeah and this is before i did any clinical research you know i was uh earning a living you know as a secretary this was before i had a master's degree and my passion was not only these wild and wonderful relationships that i had uh but also poetry 
So I was writing poetry. I was engaged in revolutionary activity. I was earning a bare living uh, because I could type really fast and do something that nobody can do today, take shorthand. Okay. So You were valuable in the marketplace. Very valuable. That was, yeah. well, even being very valuable, I was a woman secretary. I wasn't making that much money, but I was mm. at least in demand. Mm. Right. And you started to question, okay, why am I repeating these patterns in relationships? Uh, and and what, was, what was some of the answers you received for that question? Yeah, I would say this entire period, uh, which I will be writing about in the book I'm at work on now, um, I would say it led me to a very painful exploration of sexual abuse in my family. Uh, the sexual abuse that was undisclosed, uh, that had really distorted my entire sense of myself as a woman, of my body, of intimacy. I spent a long time on that one. Uh, my first published book is about this. Uh, I spent a long time looking specifically at the dynamics of sexual abuse on women, uh, on creativity, on intimacy, on sexuality. And it was painful. It was a hard time. Uh, right. But very creative simultaneously. And what modalities were you using then to explore that? Mostly art. Okay. This was before I learned uh, anything about energy medicine. This was before I learned anything about trauma resolution. I was a poet. I was a dancer. And those mediums, which I still recommend, those mediums were my outlet and also my research into myself. Uh, and I was furiously doing both of those, dance and writing, uh, while still being a secretary, uh, nine to five, and having these tempestuous uh, relationships. Right. Uh, but, but, but there was a healing effect of you engaging as intensely as you were in your art at that stage. There was release. There was some degree of understanding. There was reflection. And there was empowerment because I was taking what was pent up inside me and able to put it into form. And I was periodically reading my poetry to other people. I was, that led to an entire career uh, that eventually resulted in my master's, which is in um, creative writing. Uh, people responded to what I was writing. So I discovered not only some of the patterns of my behavior, what was behind it, but I also discovered that I wasn't alone, right. that other people resonated with it. And that was very healing. Interesting. So it's okay. So it's sort of recognizing your story in others and hearing it in similar stories in others. Yeah. And I started to get rewarded for being able to articulate this suffering. So I got published. Right. I won awards. I was on the cover of magazine uh, because of my poetry. And I would combine my poetry with music. I'd work with musicians, which was really enjoyable for me and successful at that period in San Francisco. Right. And so your, your first, your master's was in creative writing and then and how did that then evolve into this this study of of neuroscience and is that is that the first place you went in terms of understanding you know more deeply the the human condition no um it's a long story and it is part of the new book that i'm writing but i will do my best to condense it but i love your inquiries they're very juicy uh there's a lot of juice in all of this uh there were a series of relationships that really ran me down in a variety of ways, one of which resulted in the birth of my first beautiful, wonderful daughter. 
And when she was about five years old, uh, I felt like I needed to spring out of that San Francisco bohemian lifestyle I was in and and create a little bit more stability. Uh, and I had always been involved in literature. My bachelor's is in literature, my master's in creative writing. And so I moved out of San Francisco into Sonoma County and started to pursue a doctorate in literature. Um, And during that time, I realized I didn't want to lecture about literature. I wanted to write literature and live literature. And so I was in this liminal state. I was a single working mother, still making money as the secretary, (laughs) Um, writing poetry at night, but withdrawn from relationships. So I went into a kind of retreat Mm. period. And poetry, I have to say, has always been my guide. So under those circumstances in a rural part of Sonoma County, uh, working as a secretary, not quite sure what my next steps were, raising my daughter uh, as a single mother, I had time to reflect. And in that reflection time, the curiosity I had about the dynamics in my family began to take center stage, even over the poem. So I, I reached a point where writing about it was not satisfying enough. I wanted to know why this had happened and what the dynamics were. And if other people resonated with it, then those dynamics could possibly be of use to others. And really, one of the big motivations was, how could I not pass these patterns to my daughter? That's what led me to, it's still a long story, other things had to happen, but that led me ultimately to applying for a doctorate in neuroscience. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. I, I, I completely resonated. My, my, my artistic journey was actually stand-up comedy, and then I was on stage at one point, and the guy said, you know, <laughs> some of these people in 10 years' time you're going to see on your television screens some of these people you'll never see again. And some of these people should really be doing therapy. <laughs> As he said it, it was like, yeah. I totally, it, we are, it's, that it's, is so it. resonant with me because, yeah. you know, I was really pretty successful as a performing arts poet in the San Francisco Bay Area. I could have had an entire career doing that. And I loved it. But it was disturbing at the same time. It's like, People were resonating with my suffering and the beautiful way I could describe my suffering. That was troubling. You know, I, I, I was in some way struggling with how I was successful and what that meant in terms of human development and the evolution of consciousness. So I had to go deeper. Yeah. It sounds like you're like me. It wasn't enough just to weaponize the trauma for artistic That's right. Games. That's right. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. needed something more. Um, fascinating. Okay, so you you have this this, this realization. You know, you're asking what's behind the, the the poetry was, and then you then you embark on the neuroscience degree. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and, yeah. And yeah, what what was some of the early insights you? you got as you studied the brain and, and neuroscience you mentioned your father um, yeah. and you started to put some of the pieces of the puzzle there together anything else started to emerge in your study well that was the key time of realizing my father's head injury and um you know not only doing the clinical research but also doing the family research the other thing that happened uh during that time was as I assembled my committee and where I was dialoguing with the people on my committee, I was getting really positive feedback about my writing, my academic writing. Uh, my committee members were saying things like they really were not used to reading uh, doctoral papers that were enjoyable to read. 
And even though I had had all this success as a poet, a performing arts poet, I was incredibly in deficit in terms of being recognized as an intelligent human. You know, it, it just never happened in my family. It was startling to me uh, when people started to say that I was good at what I was doing. So that was, it sounds so simple and so minor. And I can tell you that it just added to this evolution of my nervous system. So my nervous system was recalibrating. I was coming into who I was rather than always being a reflection of what other people needed me to do or how I was received by others. I was starting to get a sense of my own capacity. That was incredibly revelatory. And I, I, you know, I became kind of, you know, uh, celibate. I, I say kind of because it was kind of, but mostly. <laughs> I became mostly celibate so that uh, relationships didn't dominate everything. You okay. know, that was revelatory. And that's what gave me the space to develop my own ideas, uh, which I'm now completely entranced with. Okay. Well, let's get into that then. What, what was some of, you know, what, what was in that doctoral paper? What were some of the ideas that emerged out of that? Yeah. What, what was the thesis you started to, to develop? Well, in my doctoral research, I worked at a facility for head injured people. That's, that's how the inquiries really began, how the insight came to me that these people who I was working with in my internship resembled my father in terms of their behaviors. And then one, this is a stunning story. It's not in my doctorate, but it is a big part of that research. One of the people in this facility left the facility, went into the town, and raped a little boy. And he was my client, my uh, charge in the facility. That's when I saw the relationship between head injury, violence, and sexual abuse. And that grabbed my attention on a, on a personal level. And I had to work that through personally. So the relationship between unresolved trauma and violence in, that is enacted in the community. And mm -hmm. that discovery, so my, my research is really about the experience of people with head injury who are not recognized as having that head injury. So so what it's like to function in the world with a traumatic brain injury without proper diagnosis, without proper resources, without proper treatment, uh, and the importance of treating head injury. This, of course, has become a topic in the sports world, for instance. And yeah. I would say it is still a very important area of research and uh, understanding this particular brand of trauma. And so I... I no longer work specifically with head injury, right. uh, though I do track and am able to track. So this is a unique attribute of the work that I do because I can assess if head injury, undiagnosed head injury, is playing a role in one's experience of trauma. As frequently that's missed uh, okay. because yeah. people have undiagnosed head injuries. Little ones are frequently having head injuries that are not diagnosed completely, that are not treated. Uh, and teenagers do. You know, teenagers get drunk and don't tell their parents and fall on their heads. So, you know, those head injuries, in terms of their intracranial repercussions, can be playing a role in one's experience of trauma in one's life. And I am able, because of my background, I'm able to assess that and offer treatment with the energy medicine uh, that I learned and the cranial treatment that I have learned that accompanies it. So 
while I was working on my doctorate, uh, I was exposed in what appeared to be a serendipitous moment uh, to energy medicine. Uh, I was introduced to it and was given the opportunity to study with a woman who brought a very unique system from Japan uh, to the United States. And that began to influence my personal life, my personal development. While I, I would say it was a support for me while I was writing my doctorate, and while I had the stresses of writing my doctorate, the stresses of being the supervisor of this young head injured man who had raped a child and who, of course, was taken to court and who I had to uh, testify about in court. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was very stressful for me. And yeah. I learned this energy medicine system and it supported me as a student, as a mother, as a single mother, uh, as someone juggling, earning a living, getting a doctorate, et cetera. And once I had my doctorate, I was able to really explore that energy medicine system, which is called the art of compassion. I talk about it in The Secret of Resilience. Yeah. And begin to weave it more uh, clearly into my approach to the treatment of trauma. Yeah. And I found that fascinating because simultaneously you're, you're steeped in the Western tradition of, you know, in some senses, like this reductive isolation of the brain and, and, and its injuries and the impacts and that paradigm <laughs> and you're simultaneously exploring energy medicine. What, what, was, there, was there any resistance for you or did, did you find you were able to integrate both very easily? I'm curious. Well, I was able to integrate both very easily. It made perfect sense to me and continues to make more and more and more sense. But here you have the rebel, you know. I can't seem to get away from it, you know. It's like, here I am on the brink of having a legitimate degree and a legitimate practice to earn good money, you know. Uh, and I was um, very grateful to say successful in my practice. Uh, and what do I do? <laughs> I introduce something that most of the other people in my field think doesn't fit there or is woo-woo or is completely incompatible. And I am trying to demonstrate how it is not incompatible, how it is a perfect map and how there has to be, this is before the incredible popularity of somatic therapies, uh, you know, I I was way before that, you know, trying to illustrate how until the nervous system changed, until there was a physiological shift, which I had experienced. So this recalibration of the nervous system was something I was experiencing directly. I mean, if you're a mother, you know what that means. You know, if you want to be in relationship, if you want to have a successful partnership, you know what that means. You know, if you want to digest your food and, uh, you know, have a healthy intimacy and healthy social engagement, you know what it means when your nervous system changes from being distorted and contorted into being fluid, into confidence, into boundaries and standing up for yourself. So all of that was happening for me. And I knew the energy medicine was playing a significant role in companionship with the insights, the changes in consciousness and awareness that I was having. So to me, that made perfect sense. But to my field, to my colleagues, to the institutions, to the regulatory agencies, to the universities, it was troublesome. Uh, it mm. was disturbing. It was questionable. Uh, so I was once again in the position of doing something uh, rebellious, uh, and I still am, you know, with my introduction of the importance of prenatal life and how the human nervous system is shaped dramatically by embryological experiences, I am still a paradigm changer. <laughs> right. It's like I've got a candy box in front of me now. It's like, which, 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 which thread do I pull here? They're all so interesting to me. Um, 
So I think let's let's put a pin in the early embryological life and you know and how that impacts us, you know, as as we evolve. Like I'm I'm really interested in that. Um, but I'm also interested in this energy healing system. Uh to understand from Jiro Murai, you know, from Japan, who who first discovered this. So yeah, t- describe this modality. You know, how does it work in practice? And yeah, what you've already intimated at it, but what were the big shifts that you experienced through applying this on yourself and as I understand it in your book and to others? Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful questions. So uh, again, condensed version, uh, explained further in my books and available, of course, in all of my programs. Jiro Murai uh, was a man in Japan uh, prior to World War II uh, during a phase that was really the rise of Japanese uh, nationalism and awareness of Japanese uh, healing arts. He sought was an independent uh, quester, kind of like uh, the hippies were, you might say, uh, when I first arrived in San Francisco. Uh, you don't, you don't and, really think about Japanese hippies, do you? But I'm sure, yeah, of course, they must exist. That's right. He was a Japanese hippie. I've never thought, I've never used that before, but that's exactly what he was. Uh, and he broke from his very prestigious family of Western trained uh, physicians and went out uh, on his own. And in that questing of his own, in his hippiedom, uh, he became ill actually, and was on the brink of death uh, and isolated himself in a cabin. He was diagnosed, actually, by his own family members uh, with leukemia. And in that time that he was isolated, he received the transmission of the art of compassion. He actually was guided to hold certain areas of his body, to be in contact with different sites, with different applications. And as a result of that, he recovered uh, when it was considered impossible to do so. And he was so grateful for that that he devoted himself to the quest, another quest. But this was a quest for what? he had learned in that near-death experience. Uh, The story is repeated in other forms uh, by others. It's it's how healing systems are brought out of antiquity and into contemporary times, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, What is critical is, and this is beautifully orchestrated because it's really about trauma and trauma resolution. So at the time that Jiro Mirai was feeling that he had come to understand the system that had been imparted to him, he had done his research, he had done his studies, he was sharing it uh, independently with families, with individuals. At that time, Mary, my teacher, was sent from the concentration camp, the internment camp in the United States, where her family had been imprisoned during World War II. Those camps were, quote unquote, liberated, and Mary, furious with what she had experienced, justifiably, left the United States and went to Japan. She wanted to go home. She wanted to be with her people. And there, in an apparently serendipitous event, she met Jiro Murai. Mm. And ultimately, he transmitted the system to her. This is a system, the art of compassion, is a system that arose out of the soil of Japan, but likely comes from a universal source because it's very similar to multiple other systems with a crucial difference, which is how 
easily it translates into self-care. Interesting. So Mary married an American, uh, came to the United States where I met her uh, during that period when I was in this liminal space. Uh, and I was led, it's all I can say, I was led to her classes. Uh, I had an impossible schedule. I was a secretary. I was a single mother. But I found a way uh, to go to her classes. And I was mystified, but I began the practices on myself. And at that time, I had so much that I was trying to manage uh, that a sense of peace, a sense of rightness, a sense of alignment, a sense of I can do this was hard won. And I started to use this system and it became accessible for me to feel joy in my life as it was. So suddenly this life that seemed chaotic, that seemed impossible. I mean, if you've ever been a single parent, and a working single parent, and a creative human being at the same time who has to write poetry and dance. My life was impossible. And all of a sudden, it wasn't impossible. Literally, overnight. Overnight? Overnight. Literally, overnight for me. It doesn't always work that way for everyone. But for me, it was overnight. And all of a sudden, I had clarity. And not only did I have clarity, I had humor. I was fine with it all. I was able to feel joy in my single parenting. I was able to feel joy in my mothering. I was able to feel joy in my job. Uh, and I saw a way through. I didn't know exactly what it was. But I could tell it was there. And I had this sense of purpose and health, incredible well-being and health. So I didn't know how it worked, uh, but I was not going to stop doing it. And I just became incredibly curious. I learned more and more. Uh, it became, I actually wrote poems for every site. And I called the whole system my lover because I went to sleep with it every night and I woke up to it in the morning. So it's this initiatory experience. I can tell you this. I'm spooked very much as a woman, you know, that... Well, you describe it, you describe it as a strange lover in the book, I think. Then. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly how I experienced it. You know, I couldn't even tell that to the other s students of the system. I'm sure they would think I was crazy, but it was because this was touch. This was... Touch that was, even though it's on the surface of the body, so it's a system that just requires touch on certain sites of the body. But that very light touch, it's going to sound like I'm talking about Tantra, you know, that very light touch, that very patient touch was so deep. And so this system was penetrating the ways in which the connective tissue in my body, which is the highway of information to the brain, the connective tissue in my body was organized around the suffering that I had endured, the ways in which I had compensated for what I had missed, the, you know, attachment and the... Um, confidence and the mirroring that I had missed, I had organized myself around that. And then this system penetrated those compensatory distortions of who I really was and gave birth to what I now call original brilliance. Mm, I came into my original brilliance. So the rebel became an innovator, right? The yeah the troublesome, impossible child, you know, became a genius. Uh, you know, it, I transformed, and this touch I knew was crucial because prior to the touch, this had not happened. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. And this is your touch or this 
somebody else's touch. It's my touch, and that is the critical piece. I did occasionally have treatment from another practitioner, but I had very little money, uh, and most of that money went towards raising my daughter. So having that access to such profound healing without having to go to someone else was very significant for me. And, and you're touching specific sites? Yes, and this is for, what for a long yeah. period of time, or 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 momentarily. Well, and it, it adapts to the time available. So I now call these sites the sacred sites of the body. And what is fascinating and highly relevant to everything that I do is that this is a system that begins to evolve prenatally. So you might say this entire system, the art of compassion, is energetic embryology. So it evolves with the embryo uh, and is just as organs. It, it actually evolves alongside organs uh, as a conduit of bioelectricity uh, within the human form that is evolving in response to embryonic incentive. Mm. It's fascinating you say that. We, we had another b brilliant guest on the show called Eileen McCusick, and she works with uh, sound and tuning forks, and she senses into the, the bio field. She uses that same word and, and, and finds places of stuck energy in the bio field. Now, she's using sound, not touch, but it, it sounds like it's based on a very similar principle. Exactly. Exactly. We are, you've got it. We are finding with our own hands, ourselves, these stuck mm. areas in the human biofield. And through touch, we are resolving that. Now, the time required for the touch is variable. It, you know, for me, it was happening very fast. Uh, for some people, it takes longer. And you know, it adapts to the time available. So if you have 15 minutes in the morning, uh, it, you will feel the difference. I mean, I treat myself every morning. Uh, and I treat my, you can treat yourself throughout the day. I've been treating myself while I'm talking to you. Um, yes, you know, yes. you just, the site, it's a wonderful map. It's highly accessible and it's, it interfaces with the acupuncture map, but it's much simpler than that. So it's incredibly empowering. Wow. And you mentioned, uh, in the book, Michael with cerebral palsy oh. and your effect on him. I, that was an arresting story for me. C could you share it was, that? Oh, yes. Thank you so much for remembering that. So this is in this interlude when um, I am so much an early learner of the art of compassion and uh, I'm living in a little apartment complex and with my daughter and my neighbor is a grandma with two children and I really don't like this grandma. She's a smoker for one thing, you know, and I'm trying to live this very pristine life and she's a smoker and uh, very rough spoken and she has these two little children which confuses me. She's clearly not their mother or their father. She's clearly responsible for them. Uh, and actually the daughter, uh, the grand, her granddaughter becomes friends with my little daughter. Uh, so I'm exposed to them quite a bit. And one day the grandma knocks on my door and asks if I would watch Michael, the little boy who has cerebral palsy and who's bedridden most of the time, but she, I see them occasionally when she's pushing him in a wheelchair. She asks if I would watch him because she has to take her daughter somewhere, and I agree to do that. So I'm in her stinky apartment, you know, just reeks of totally cluttered stuff everywhere, you know, just the opposite of what I'm trying to do. And this little one is in this crib, and he is agonizingly sounding and moving and I, I look at him and I feel I know this art of compassion. 
I must use it to see if I can help him. And I realize I don't have permission. I've just been asked to watch him. But knowing that the system can't do any harm, and I'm not a practitioner, I don't have my doctorate at this point. Um, so I take the risk. Uh, and I start to use the art of compassion on little Michael in the crib. And in a really short shrift, the agonizing sounds change to little coos and the kind of distorted limbs relax. And Michael falls asleep. And he drops into this deeply calm and restful sleep. And when Grandma comes back, she's amazed because he looks so at peace. And I tell her what I did, and we become friends. Beautiful. I mean, I'm going to cry just talking about it because she brought out her album, of photos of herself, and I saw what a beautiful young woman she was, and her son had become a drug addict and married a drug addict, and they had these two children, and this is why she is now in charge of Michael and his sister. And I hear the whole background story, and I see the beautiful woman here who is struggling with these conditions, and yeah, that's the story of Michael. And then I felt deeply committed to practicing the art of compassion. I imagine. And, and with Michael, did, did you continue working with him? Did you teach it to his grandmother? Exactly. I did. And uh, it helped them enormously. Ultimately, Michael had a surgery that corrected his structure. Of course, he wasn't going to be able to be free of the cerebral palsy, but he was able to live in a much more healthy and peaceful way in his body. And his grandma had a resource that she could use, and she started to use that resource for herself. And so, and did she experience, well, no, I won't lead the question. What did she experience as a result of using it herself? Yeah, she was struggling because she was really angry at, at the situation that she was in and the various systems she had to interact with as a result of so many factors. But she, I wouldn't say that she had this total transformation that I had, but she had a change of lifestyle. Her life became better. Her life became more healthy. Uh, and she began to feel more at peace with what was her role in life and her stewardship of those two beautiful children. Right, right. I, I, so what intrigues me here is the simplicity of the approach you're describing. Yes. Because to the extent that I'm familiar with other energy healing systems, that it's not like I've got you know, masses of exposure, but this sounds much simpler than anything else I've heard of. Well, it is quite deep and intricate once you begin to study it, but it's not necessary that you learn that intricacy to simply apply it and use it. Mm. Uh, it's that simple that you simply learn this map of the body and you begin to touch these sites, and then there are specific combinations of these sites that lead to particular outcomes. And then there is much more intricate diagnostics. There is a pulse listening system very similar to what acupuncturists use. Uh, and you are able to do quite significant assessment as a result of that. But on the initial experience of the system, it is very, very simple. And it is simple. I continue to do those simple applications throughout the day, every day. And it's what allows me, I think, to rise above, for instance, the incredible violence of the world we're living in right now. Mm -hmm. And I know that anybody listening to this, including me, is going to be like, well, okay, could you give me like the three minute version or the two minute version? Or is it something you do have to do a bit of study on? Like, can, is it something I you could share on the podcast? I can, I can give a taste of the system. 
Uh, and I just have to reflect for a moment in terms of uh, what it is to bring forward. Let me give you a, a taste of a cranial application, actually, since that's one of the subjects we've ventured into. And this is quite helpful for those like you and I who are spending quite a bit of time in front of screens uh, fulfilling our purpose in life. Uh, so I'm going to invite you and people watching and listening to just bring the palm of one hand, it doesn't matter which one, to the base of the cranium. So literally the edge of my thumb is resting at the edge of my cranium at the level of the very basic structure of the occiput. And what, my sorry, fingers. Sorry, what cranium and occiput for? Okay, the <laughs> occiput. Like isn't quite yeah, sure. The occiput is the base of your cranium. So okay. your uh, spinal and your cranium column, is just another word for your skull. Your skull, yes. Let's just use the word skull. At the base of your skull, there is a bony structure, and that's the occiput. It's the base of the occiput. So you're going to support mm. the base of your skull with the palm of your hand. With the base of my thumb is at one aspect, mm. and my fingertips doesn't matter which ones. Uh, are at the other aspect. And just as you do that, as you are supporting the base of your skull, let your head fall back into your hand. Just allow your head to rest. And as you're doing this, let your joints soften, let your body just drop into whatever surface you might be sitting on or standing on. Just allow yourself to feel grounded and connected. And then bring the opposite hand to your forehead. So similarly, your base of your thumb is on one aspect of your forehead. Fingertips are falling on the other aspect. So you're going to be cradling your occiput and your forehead and let your cranium, your skull, your head fall back further and let your breath deepen. You are actually holding four of these sacred sites. Let your face soften and let's just spend a moment in this cranial release. Let your exhalation be about twice as long as your inhalation. You may notice pulsations in the places where your hands are resting. And notice how those pulsations resonate with one another. Chuck in to your sensations. Just track them. Don't try to interpret them at all. Just become aware of them. When perhaps your breath deepens even further. Perhaps you feel a wave of stillness throughout your skull, throughout your cranium. And the word cranium is just a little more descriptive of the various structures within your skull. As you house in your skull a symphony of structures that are pliable. 
that have motility and that can reorganize and are reorganizing as you hold these sites. And you can imagine that if you're lying in bed or lying back against a chair back, how luscious this feels. Well, I'm noticing it's interesting is in the beginning, which is the opposite of what you'd expect, I, I felt some kind of strain in, in my, certainly the, they are behind my head having to hold my head up, but, but now it feels completely relaxed. Even though oh, I've wonderful. Been yes. The skull for a long yeah. time. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that because that can happen. But I would say 99% of the time, it resolves that quickly. And then, whenever you feel ready, when you want to move your hands away, I'm going to suggest that you bring the palms of your hands together and a slight pressure here so that all the fingers are touching one another, all the parts of the fingers. And you can bring this to the heart level. This is called an inju. So that's another word for mudra. This is the inju of alignment. So when you use this inju, and you could place this inju at the heart, you could place it at the third eye, you could place it at the throat. The heart is a lovely position responding to our mention of Uncle Angana and melting the ice in the heart mm. of man. This will do that, but it will do it in an expansive way. You will feel yourself coming into alignment, alignment with purpose, alignment with destiny, alignment with who you really are. And this seals the release so that it is integrated throughout your body head to toe. This is centering, this frees you from being distracted. It keeps you focused on course, which we must learn to do. We live in a time where distraction is a manipulative tool and we must see our way through to the truth. Let your breath deepen further. And then whenever you're ready, just release your hands and notice how you feel. What do you notice? I actually, I actually feel like I feel after a yoga session, but that's 90 minutes. This was like three minutes. Yeah, it's, it's powerful stuff. It is. It is. It's simple. It's effective. It's transformative. And yeah, I have to say, I was starting to get a stiff neck. I mean, I've been staring at this laptop. I've been up since five thirty my time, so you know, I've, I've been up whatever long time now. And uh, yeah, my my neck was starting to get sore. It's, it's, I can I can say it's completely gone. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Beautiful. <laughs> This is, this is just such a wonderful, yeah, wonderful conversation. We're, you know, we're sliding in. It's like we, we, we're traversing east and west and some sort of pendulous motion. Yes, yeah, I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for your questions and your curiosity. Right. And I want to keep going. I really want to know about, yeah, your insights, into this idea of our evolution from conception, from the, the prenatal experience, how the nervous system evolves, how it integrates with our energy system or interplays with the energy system. Yeah. Can you describe a little bit more some of the insights you've gained from your study in that area, which yes. I know is asking you to sum up a lifetime's work almost, but. I'm delighted to be asked this question, and everybody I know is already clear that what I'm going to say is going to be condensed, but what I must begin with is that our entire understanding of who or what the embryo is needs 
uh, a makeover. So the the human embryo, the conceptus, initiates itself. So there's much more volatility and intentionality in embryonic uh, fule of development. So the embryo is highly productive, highly uh, active in shaping itself, shaping its organic structures, and always in contact with the environment. So embryonic folding and unfolding, which is rhythmic and constant and prolific, so cellular proliferation and choices about apoptosis or cell death. Well, that, oh, is, is that what that means? Yeah. Okay. yeah op, so it's a, apoptosis, which is cell death, is as important as cellular proliferation. And that's, that's an important awareness that uh, I think we all need to expose ourselves to that as we proliferate, as we grow, as we evolve, we're letting go all the time. We have to release and discard that which is cluttering development, which is su superfluous to our development. And embryonic embryogenesis is doing that actively. So the embryo is in constant motion. So even, you know, if mom might report the baby is very still, that is superficial. The baby is never still. The baby is always actively generating herself. And in that generation and discarding of what's unnecessary in a folding and unfolding way, the embryo is always, and I say the embryo, but I'm talking about you. I'm talking about me. We're in relationship to all of the environmental influences. And those environmental influences are structure, the structure of the mother's womb, uh, the history within the mother's womb. So the mother's womb contains her intergenerational history and her personal history. If there have been any losses, et cetera, whether she's conscious of them or not. All of that information is in the womb biofield. And the energies and ideation of the people in the environment is also penetrating the placental barriers coming in to the womb field. Uh, and that includes the family, the extended family, but even beyond that, the community and the state of the world. And the embryo, you and I, we are responding to all of that and adjusting because we know as we are developing that this is the world we are going to inhabit. And we are learning. I mean, the embryonic experience is highly educational. We are learning all the time so that we can be born, so that we can come into that world. And we have needs as a result of those exposures. And often those needs are not met because there's not consciousness of them. There isn't an attunement always. Uh, sometimes there is. But under most circumstances, the way in which the medical system has distorted prenatal life and pregnancy and the birth process, the way in which medicine has become industrialized uh, and serves purposes beyond life uh, that have to do with individuals and systems and corporations and a kind of capitalistic structure, the understanding of what those needs are becomes removed from people. They don't consider them. They've been educated not to consider them. Does it, am I explaining this in yeah, a way that? No, it, 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 it's fascinating and it, it, it certainly makes yeah, complete sense. And, and something that immediately pinged with me was it, it's one thing, you know, sort of where I'm at in my acceptance of these ideas and that I am a bio field <clears throat> with, with a, a, a physical aspect. 
but of course, I, I was a biofield in those embry embryological stages that was was interacting with the biofield, as you say, of my, of my mother, of, of the womb, which itself is connected to, as you said, not just the, its physical sort of environs, but but the thought patterns, the ideations. It, I mean, it's yeah, it, it's it's uh, a it's a much richer il illustration of embryonic development than certainly I tend to think of it and people to of, of this, you know, this little mini human getting bigger, right? Which is, to, I suppose, the way people tend to think about that stage of life. Exactly. Thank you. You clearly understand what I'm talking about and what I have experienced. So I'm not just talking about a theory here. I'm talking about what I have learned and continue to learn from myself, but also from the thousands and thousands of people who I have had the privilege of serving, who have been able to remember, and this is critical, have been able to remember their earliest experiences, their experiences of formation. I've created a structure, I call it the rediscovery journey, that is very simple, like the art of compassion in its use to access these memories. People are remembering as early as the formation of the primitive streak, which is the initial spinal column. So it is possible to remember because there is sensory consciousness, somatic consciousness at that time. So as we interact and make adjustments with the environment and compensations and those needs that evolve in those interactions are, for the most part, with exceptions, thank God, unrecognized. So we then develop ways that allow us to survive even when those needs go unrecognized. And so our original brilliance, which I discovered for myself and which I assist people in discovering for themselves become somewhat obfuscated uh, and uh, we even lose track of it as we begin to adjust to this world that we have elected and that comes with so many compromises but those compromises allow us to survive. Once having made it to postnatal life, uh, we want to do everything we can to reclaim the original brilliance. Um, and that's what the Tara approach is about. And that original brilliance is also resilience, is also vitality, is there's no separation between that understanding of why we're here and our physical, physiological health. Uh, so within the TAR approach, it's the beauty of the art of compassion is that while it brings peace and it brings humor and it brings clarity of mind and it brings prescience, which I believe is the outcome of the resolution of trauma, uh, the capacity to be visionary, it also brings physiological health that comes with the recalibration of the nervous system. Right. Wow. <laughs> so this, the, so I, I, I can completely accept that people can remember their their spinal column forming you know, prenatally because because I, as I shared before, I came on the show. Yeah, I, I nearly died, died in my birth, and I've done a lot of reliving and remembering of my prenatal trauma, and ultimately releasing that, and that has had enormous physiological benefits. Well, it, the list goes on and on. And I, I, but what's new to me is this idea that, you know, even without necessarily considering that we might have sort of baked in traumatic memories, we may just have a natural facility if we choose to access it to, to remember any of those early stages of birth uh, and, and oriented towards not necessarily just releasing trauma, but discovering our original brilliance, which is... Yeah, very compelling idea. Uh, so, yeah, maybe we'll start with you. What, what have you 
found yourself being able to access that far back and what's that been like and what has been the outcome of that? Yes, definitely. Uh, I, and it's been, it's definitely had its challenging moments, but as you mentioned earlier, incredible spiritual awakening has come from accessing these early memories. So I was able to remember, and this, this happened, uh, this is, I tell about this in The Secret of Resilience. Uh, this happened before I studied embryology. Uh, I, through my deep inner attunement, that is what made me a poet, I believed that I remembered that my mother tried to abort me. That was agonizing um, and a huge struggle. But ultimately, I was able to confirm, not easily, but nevertheless, certainly, uh, confirm that this memory was accurate. So I had to interview my mother. Uh, my wonderful marriage now uh, is to an attorney. So he accompanied me, and he was very helpful in uh, holding the ground so that my mom felt safe in being able to share that she had indeed more than once tried to abort me. And it was understandable to me that she made that attempt. The circumstances were such that it was sensible to me, but because abortion was illegal uh, at that time, um, and because she didn't want to tell anybody about it, the means that she used were brutal. Uh, the important piece of information, though, is that I survived. Uh, and I speak to my memories of that in The Secret of Resilience. Mm. So that has so many ramifications. Everything that I just said has so many ramifications, uh, including political ramifications at this time. Uh, but which are very important to me, uh, but I won't, we won't go there right now. Uh, we'll stay with the personal development here. So I was able to remember that and to validate that, and that led me to have even more respect for myself, even an amazing sense of respect for myself. Uh, and then... Here is really the clincher. I was able to remember how I did survive those abortion attempts. And that led me to being able to articulate my original brilliance, mm. uh, which is, you know, first of all, astounding curiosity and astounding creativity uh, that I am able to. And it's so, even saying it now is difficult for me uh, for a variety of reasons, but I was able to problem solve a death threat elegantly. Right. It's hard for me to say that without uh, crying with the recognition of it. It's still... Um, challenging for me to experience myself as a problem solver, um, as a strategist, as uh, someone who can meet a challenge of this magnitude. But indeed, I have met it countless times. And it is because of that that I believe we can problem solve our way through this time which is a huge death threat that we are living in every day that is breaking my heart. But I have experience with this. Mm. Oh, it is that experience that is my hope. And it's not an idle hope. It's not a fantasy hope. It's a hope based on surviving death threats. Yeah. And what I, what I love about this framing is that 
it, it's beyond understanding our recovery from trauma as, as a release of a blockage or a release of energy uh, trapped in, in the body or in the biofield, however we choose to characterize it. It's, it's also a recognition of our, of our brilliance in moving through that. Yes. And, I, and I'm not sure that, that therapy, certainly my experience, experience of therapy, uh, has an orientation towards that ultimate conclusion. And that's what I like no. about what you're saying. Yeah, it's ultimately my entire purpose mm. uh, in my work with people and with groups is to awaken the awareness of original brilliance. It's, it's, it's beyond trauma resolution. I understand, yeah. believe me, very personally, the importance of trauma resolution. But the goal is the discovery and the embodiment of original brilliance, yeah. of each individual's original brilliance. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love that. I absolutely love that. Um, yeah. I'm moved by it. Yeah. And it's giving me something to think about. Ah, wonderful. And, 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 and I'm I can feel moved. my arms crossing, right? You, you can sense I've got this this resistance to accepting that reality, the reality of my own brilliance. Um, and, uh, well, you can maybe, see I struggle with it also. Right. Uh, I, yeah. Perhaps that's, well, that's the, well, the way I, you talk about it in the book, right? You know, with um, the ego and the role of ego and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's check on connection. Yeah. The embryo has no ego. Mm. Embryos have no ego. Yeah. yeah. But in my sense is it's my ego that doesn't want to embody yes, my quite possibly. brilliance, right? Yeah. Quite possibly, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so the ego then is a compensation for the way your needs were not met. Uh, and, I mean, that's a big part of the rediscovery journey template is how do we meet those unmet needs uh, and therefore stop waiting for them to be met uh, right. by anybody, right. even your wonderful partner, you know? Right, yeah. Or, or, yeah, consumerism or, yeah, consumption, yeah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And, okay, and this, and this, but it seems to me that process of discovery uh, the, the way that you view it and that remembering it is through an energetic lens. Yeah. Yes, very much so. Yes, mm. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you're marrying these two aspects. There's the, the art of compassion and the, and the remembering. Absolutely. And that, uh, the art of compassion really helps us to sustain the o original brilliance because we'll, oh. As you're saying, the ego, we, we're going to want to forget about it or put it away or make it unimportant. And it actually is everything. And so the art of compassion practices keeps us on track. But this is a visionary destiny at this point uh, that where we are in the world, you know, we are uh, mired in uh, what created climate crisis. So we have to have this prescience, which comes with uh, embryonic intelligence, original brilliance. Mm. 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 And can you shed a little bit of light on how that process works? Is it, yeah, just, just the, the going back? Anna, okay, yeah. Uh, so what I've created, and it's, um, it's a very simple template, but it's quite rich, uh, is a guided meditation. Very simple. It's anti-hypnotic. I'm, I'm not hypnotizing anyone or I'm not even creating a hypnotic environment. I'm, I'm avoiding that uh, so that it's very grounded. Uh, but it, it starts with a focus on the breath. There's an awareness of breath. There's a sensory um, tracking. Sensory tracking is a very important part of what I teach. I believe that when we really own our sensory experience, then that's what leads us to trusting uh, 
sensory intelligence or cellular intelligence, you know, in other words, non-cognitive uh, intelligence, somatic intelligence. So there's a short, you know, um, guided dropping in to the body uh, so that we begin to take our awareness inward and make it highly somatic as much as we possibly can. And then there is a playful interlude, really, of engaging creativity and the imagination. Uh, and I use certain metaphors that help people to allow themselves to experience, uh, you know, a willing suspension of disbelief. So that you get into this creative space and then... And people love that. They're just so happy. And I tell you that I am doing this with people who have not studied anything about this, who are not aware of energy medicine or prenatal life that are experiencing something like this for the first time. So that playful interlude of bringing in permission to play and be creative with your inner world uh, then takes us on literally a journey called the rediscovery journey. We begin to travel through the stages of life and we start to enter the precognitive field of early sensory experience, which is, I, you can see it when I'm even talking about it, I'm already mm -hmm. there, you know, I, I start to, you know, move with it uh, as people do. They will and move you know with it. <laughs> so I can't contain it. You know, I get into my own embryonic sensuality. And we start to experience this memory, this somatic memory of what it was like just to be so curious about the world, which is really the nature of original brilliance. It's so curious about how things taste and how things smell. And then there is this curiosity and you see it in little ones uh if you watch little ones at all if you have little ones and you have seen them develop you see how people's energies influence them so profoundly you see how little ones are responding to the biofields around them so i'm dropping people through this very gentle grounded process into their memory of that time and then earlier and earlier and earlier and trying to not be hypnotic about it, but just to kind of go through these stages in a very grounded way of precognitive experience. And the instruction says that, and it's true every single time, there are moments, holographic moments that are going to emerge from this exploration, and there always is. And of course, sometimes it's multiple moments, but all of those moments are holographically united, and those moments are teachers. So there are points in our precognitive life, and they're holographic, they're summaries of the teaching that our own embryonic intelligence wants to deliver to us. And in this works every single time. The holographic memory might be a sensational, it might be an image, it might be colors, it might be, you know, a sense of this vast environment that you're in that has certain textures. And from that, I guide people to identifying the need of that holographic experience. And then... Right meeting that need uh, using parts of the cell. Uh, so I'm summarizing here. There's a lot of mm. detail while it still remains quite simple. I mean, that, basically, that's it. There's, there's, we are our own teachers. So I'm just witnessing. I'm not doing anything. Uh, I am privileged to have some protocols that help people to discover themselves. Uh, and I am just 
mentoring them through the recognition and the validation of what they are trying to tell themselves, uh, supporting people in the awarenesses that they have had, but that they have been trained to discard and to think are irrelevant. And that comes with this whole package of misinformation um, about who we are and why we're here that has been colonized and handed to us. And that, you know, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about colonization, capitalism, patriarchy. It's like, I want to really pierce that whole uh, manipulation of human potential and let the human potential do its thing. Because right. I trust that. That's where I want my attention to be. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, when I, I see people railing against like the government with a big G, you know, whichever side of the spectrum they're on, it's like, yeah, there's a, there's a more important governance. And it's your governance of your own soul, which you've internalized, yes. you know, in here. Start, 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 yes. start investigating the conspiracies of your own internal governance. I That's going to get you a yes. lot further in terms of uh, liberation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's where it all starts. Yeah. The rest will take care of itself. Right. Yeah. Be yeah. Become a become a, fr a free expression, a free expression of your original brilliance, and uh, yes, yeah, all of these issues will seem uh, parochial. <laughs> Exactly. Parochial is the right word. Yeah. Yeah. Because we, uh, yeah, the kingdom's within, somebody once said. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, yeah. So, th yeah. Thank you for, for elaborating on that. Uh, yeah. It, it, it sounds uh, like a wonderful process. Um, it is. And it, uh, it's, I'm still, just delighted that it works beautifully every single time, no matter who I'm doing it with. Yeah, and and I love I love that again that the, the orientation of joyful exploration, because a lot of my experience in working you know, that far back and with my own history is in the in the paradigm paradigm of, of pain release, and and it had served me right. I like it, but I. I yeah, what's resonating with me is this slightly different emphasis on a, yeah, on a playful, is, joyful exploration. That is the nature of embryonic life, yeah. joyful exploration. That is who we are as embryos. And we are still embryos. We are still engaged in joyful exploration. That's what embryos do is joyfully explore. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, wow. Well, we've been, <laughs> we've been going for, for 90 minutes here. It, is there anything yeah, we've not touched on yeah, in, in terms of, the, I suppose, the summary aspects? I mean, obviously, we, you know, we've, in the scheme of all of the work you've done here, we, we've had a relatively short time. But in terms of the salient points of your, of your work, uh, is there anything we've not touched on? You've done a beautiful job, and I want to express my appreciation to you in letting yourself be uh, joyfully curious. I love it. I feel very met and mirrored by uh, this dialogue, and I appreciate enormously the opportunity to share my faith in humanity. You know, this is such a difficult time to continue to have faith in humanity, but it is because of my awareness of original brilliance that I will never give up my love and faith in humanity. And through the processes that I've described with you and the incredible support uh, physiologically uh, and emotionally and spiritually of the art of passion, I believe that it is within everyone's range, everyone, no matter who you are, to access original brilliance and manifest it with confidence in this world and that it is wanted and needed and the world is ready and eager for 
that expression. Thank you. What a message. Thank you. And thank you for that. <laughs> but like, I've had some, some, some free therapy, some free, uh, free instruction on this, this technique. I'm going to take that away. I, I appreciate that. The, the art of compassion. I'm definitely going to explore that further after this. Um, yeah. So for people who want to explore more, uh, where's the best place to send them, Stephanie? Yeah, tara-approach.org. Uh, and there's also stephanieminds.com is another uh, mm. avenue. Uh, and I have a Substack platform where I post regularly as well. It's called Chrome Speak. Chrome Speak. Yeah. What's the, um, yeah, what's the meaning behind that? I'm interested. Chrome Speak. Well, I am very thrilled beyond measure to be an elder uh, okay. and I, I think that's part of my message uh, is uh, elders are juicy elders are an incredible resource for this world and so Chrome Speak is a platform for elder wisdom and to encourage elder wisdom particularly from women okay got it but got it's it. available to everyone yes yeah Wonderful. Okay, so that's Chrome Speak on Substack. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll get all of those links out there. Oh, thank you. Thank uh, you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting this out in, into the world. Thank you so much. And uh, for more people to yeah, remember their brilliance. Yeah. Okay. Um, wonderful. Well, thank you very much.